how they get quiet really quick. Wow, interesting. Uh, well, we are glad to have each and every one of you with us uh, tonight. Uh, it's going to be a special time together, and we have our Regen Choir back up here tonight, and we're glad to have them, and uh, they're fired up. We gave them ice cream, so they are ready to go, all right? Let's stand as we sing, all right? Our praise team make their way on up, and let's sing, oh, 4,000 tongues to sing, all right?
pray with me? Oh, Lord, we do uh, praise you and all creation praises you. Uh, if we were silent, the rocks would cry out and in fact, the heavens do cry out your praise without ever ceasing. Lord, you are glorious beyond uh, description. We, 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 just, we just exalt you tonight and are happy to do so in song uh, and in, in hearing the word proclaimed in, in today giving our offerings and Lord, we just want to praise you and we want you to uh, inhabit our praise as we gather tonight. We, we love you, Lord, and uh, we just ask that as we continue to sing in this service and as Riley will preach uh, just a little later on, Lord, that you would speak to us through him and speak to us through the words of the songs and the scriptures. Uh, we give you great glory tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, you can be seated, and as you're seated, I uh, want to say welcome to you. I'm glad that you are here and that you've come back to worship with us uh, on Sunday evening of this Lord's Day. Brother Al wanted me to say a word about who's going to be bringing the message to us tonight. Riley Hambrick is, um, is an intern uh, with us this, this year and actually next year. Uh, he's been interning with our college ministry. He's a graduate of Auburn University. Um, he's in grad school right now. But he is interning with our college ministry and also with Brother Al a little bit. Uh, he's going to be doing an internship this summer with the uh, Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, I'll let him say anything else he wants to say about himself when he comes a little later on. But he's going to bring us a great message from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I hope you are come ready to, to hear. I know the Lord will speak through him. But uh, anyway, I'm glad that you are here. And we want to welcome each other at this time. So if you don't mind, stand and greet those who are around you.
with us as they make their way down. A few Sunday nights ago, we did a, a little medley of songs, and so many of you have wanted us to do some of those. So throughout the summer, every Sunday night, we're going to do two or three of those songs and some that you haven't heard in a long time. All right? So if you don't know it, just come along with us. All right, here we go. For all that you've done, I will thank you. For all that you're going to do. For all that you've promised and all that you are. It's all that has carried me through. Jesus, I thank you. And I thank you.
be seated. Well, it is uh, a great privilege to stand before um, all of you tonight. Uh, as Kevin said, my name is Riley Hambrick, and I have uh, served as an intern with the college ministry uh, since last June, so uh, just about a year now. Um, and Lakeview has been my home church since 2016 when I was here as a freshman. Uh, and, and for several years, um, I have been weighing this, the, the decision of whether or not I wanted to attend seminary. And so I had the opportunity uh, after graduating to stay here for grad school. And, and while doing so, I asked Kevin if I could just also take the additional time here uh, to come on staff and, and figure out if, if seminary was in fact going to be the next step. And, and so here I am. Um, and, and I do, uh, do want to say that um, this, is, uh, this is a big deal for me. Um, and it's very humbling uh, because right now um, I am standing where uh, the most influential men in my life uh, have stood. And um, from the start of my freshman year, I've been discipled, and I have been encouraged and loved um, by the very men uh, who, who uh, have stood where I currently stand. Um, and and it, is, um, it is a great honor and a great privilege to uh, teach from this pulpit. So thank you, Brother Al, for um, entrusting me with it. Um, but I'll also add uh, that year after year, uh, I've listened to all of you uh, as you have passionately worshipped the Lord, um, and, and I've watched you closely as, as all of you have fellowshiped with one another and loved uh, one another. Um, and so, so I do want to just go ahead and say also that it is not only the pastors here at Lakeview that have uh, just deeply, deeply influenced my, uh, my walk with the Lord, um, but uh, this church has as well, um, all of you. Uh, and, and so it is a blessing to see such a devoted and loving congregation uh, but I do also want you to hear uh, more about God's Word than you hear about myself, so I'll continue to keep my introduction brief. Um, but uh, just to share, that like, while I was growing up, I was kind of uh, unique in the sense that uh, I was never the kid who wanted to be a superhero or a famous celebrity or, any, or you know, a famous uh, football star, uh, even though we all know that I have the, the great physique of a fine linebacker, um, just as my father had intended me to. Um, <laughs> Um, but um, instead of all these things, uh, I was always drawn to politics, and, and I was so uh, since I was eight years old. Uh, and so I think just through certain experiences from my childhood and, and everything, I was able to develop uh, just a keen sense of, of the fact that the world as it is right now is just not how it's supposed to be. Um, and, and I've always wanted to do something about it, and it is the way that uh, I best live and apply the gospel uh, is... Uh, through the world of politics, that I see these great allegories for the Christian faith uh, and, and just great opportunities for us as the church to be hearers and doers uh, of, of the word. Um, and, and it's just been uh, really, really uh, interesting to see uh, what opportunities the Lord has afforded me as my interest has only grown um, over, uh, over the years. Um, and so when Brother Al gave me the opportunity to, to come here and, uh, and speak to you all tonight, uh, my mind kind of entered this euphoric shuffle of uh, figuring out uh, which biblical passage I could uh, use that I've clung to over the years that uh, has uh, both inspired uh, a deeper love for the Lord and his people, uh, but also the ones that have uh, moved me to act on, on these affections. Uh, and so tonight you'll see some of these themes in the message uh, where we'll be looking at the life of Christ's ambassadors uh, and examining how we might be better stewards of his message of, of hope. Uh, and so if you would, uh, take your Bibles and open them to 2 Corinthians 5, uh, where we'll be looking at uh, verses 14 through 21. And as you're flipping there, uh, I'll just go ahead and share why I chose the, uh, this text for tonight. Um, and, and as you know, uh, Brother Al also shares a, a deep, deep love for politics. And, uh, and I suppose you could say that this has kind of been a source of, um, of, uh, of bromance between uh, the pastor and I. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and uh, just over the years, and, and so that's been great fun. But whereas Brother Al has been most interested in the life of the U.S. Senator, as he frequently shares, uh, I've been most interested in the life of the U.S. Ambassador. Uh, and, and the role of the Ambassador is one where their esteem really allows them uh, to act as these, these just great conduits of, of peace and prosperity for the international order, right? And so, uh, but they also are uh, in the act of championing uh, the highest ideas upon which the American democracy uh, was founded. Uh, and they do so, uh, of course, in the countries that they serve. And so I hope that the same way, or I hope that the, the same might be true of us as Christians, 
uh, not pertaining to diplomacy and statecraft, rather, but, um, but representatives for hope and truth uh, to the world around us. Uh, so it, um, it's these kind of themes that I hope to expound on as we're looking on, uh, at this text. Uh, but we'll, we'll start actually in verse 10, just provide a little bit of context. Uh, but like I said, the main focus of the, of the um, passage will be on 14 through 21. Uh, but we'll also read through uh, chapter 6, verse 2. All right. So, uh, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due um, uh, for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Verse 14, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who might live, uh, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Uh, The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Verse 18, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with them, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain, For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Um, And with that, I'll just go ahead and and, uh, open us in prayer. Um, Father God, um, I I thank you for this opportunity. Um, And I I just ask that um, you speak through me, uh, but also that we may see clearly the text that um, is before us now. Um, God, you have, you have saved us and you have redeemed us, um, but we also know that you have commissioned us. Uh, and it is only by your grace and your mercy um, that we may be faithful stewards of this gospel message. And may we, as ambassadors for Christ, share with all faithfulness the story of hope and life uh, to a despairing and dying world. And, and Father God, um, would, you, would you just soften our hearts um, to this very text? Um, we love you and we praise you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Um, and so, uh, so Paul, uh, in, this, in this section, Paul has just reminded us that, that as ministers of a new covenant, our aim is to please the Lord. And why is this? Because at the end of our life, or when judgment comes, we know that some will either be welcomed into the fellowship of Christ, uh, into the fellowship of heaven by the atoning work of Christ, or that they will spend eternity in suffering forever away from the Father. Um, and, um, and, and because Paul knows the grim fate of those who never came to a saving faith in Christ, that they, that they will perish, um, he says two very important things that, uh, that we should look at. First, in uh, verse 11, he says, um, he's saying, in spite of, of, the, of the fact that we will one day stand before uh, and, and be judged according to the things that we've done, uh, verse 11, he says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Uh, and so because of the significance of the, of the looming judgment uh, for all people and those carrying the gospel message, uh, we, are, we are currently persuading others to obedience and faith. And secondly, in verse 14, uh, he says uh, that his motivation for devoting his life uh, to, persuade, uh, to this persuasion, to persuading others to faith, as he's currently doing, um, is because of the love of Christ that controls him. And of course, some translations use the word compel. I like that word. Uh, and, it, and so it is because of love that he has for Christ that he is compelled to share uh, the gospel. And, and the reason that I bring this up is because 
of the theme of reconciliation that we've heard repeated throughout this, uh, throughout these verses. Um, and, and we've heard it several times, and, uh, and for some people, uh, this section of the text is often used as uh, a launching pad to talk about the church's role in, uh, in, in social justice or, or even the Christian's role in relational he- uh, healing. Uh, and so people will read this and, and see the word reconcile and then couple it with the word ambassadors for Christ and talk about how it is the duty of the Christian to be advocates and defenders of justice and promoters of every good thing um, and, and that we should go to the brother that has wronged us or that, uh, that we have wronged and, and seek to heal that relationship. Uh, and, and while it is true that we should do these things, right, like I think, uh, I think the Bible makes that clear, um, this just isn't what this section of the Bible is, is actually talking about. So here, right, like here, Paul's letter is not about horizontal reconciliation or, or mending the relationships between you and I, uh, but rather what Paul is talking about is, is actually vertical reconciliation or uh, the act of being made right with God. Uh, so, uh, and so the process through which God has chosen to do this, the way that God chooses to, to tell his, his created beings how, to, how this might be done uh, is, of course, through us, through you and me. Uh, and so we all know the Great Commission here, right? Like, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, of course, like, the, the key phrase here being teaching them, teaching them all I have commanded you. And, and we do this, how? By sharing the gospel um, and, and so in this section, Paul has formally called us ambassadors for Christ, by which he encourages us to be faithful in, in proclaiming this message. And so uh, with all that being said, we'll look at the first point for the, uh, for the night, uh, the need for Christ's ambassadors. And we'll see this in verse 14, and 16, or 14 through 16, uh, where it reads, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died, for all, that those who might live no longer live for themselves, uh, but for him who, for their sake, died and was raised. Uh, and so this is what Paul has devoted his life to. Like, this is the reason that, uh, that he and, and he is now encouraging us to participate in the Great Commission, right? Like, all have died. Uh, all are dead in their sins and trespasses against the Lord. Uh, but Paul has come to know the way to eternal life and the way to salvation uh, from sins. What is it? Well, verse 15. It is, it is he, Christ, it is he who died for all, who for our sake suffered and bled and died in our place. Um, and, and then, of course, as we know, the, the great triumph of the Christian faith uh, is that he rose, proud and victorious, uh, as the conqueror over death. Um, and, and so, again, like the reason that we, uh, the reason for the spread of the gospel is that man has been cursed from the fall. And as a result, man is totally, utterly depraved uh, and, and is hellbound for eternity. Uh, where he will suffer in ways beyond comparison. Um, but the, the, the encouraging part, the silver lining here, um, is, that, is that we as Christians know the way of salvation. Um, and so you don't have to flip there, but I'll just reference it. Uh, Galatians 13 and 14, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, so that we may receive the promise of the Spirit. Uh, and so, you know, that's great, that's awesome, but just the point of clarity um, Christ did not become the curse in the sense that he was made a sinner, right? Uh, but rather Christ became the curse in the sense that he was the one to bear the consequences of our sin. He was the one to uh, bear the consequences or the, the wrath of God. Um, and, uh, and, and just following along, verse 16, where it says, uh, From now on, therefore, uh, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Uh, and, and so this one, at uh, this point here, is, is subtle, but it's still also really important. Uh, so when Paul had his encounter with the Lord on the road to Damascus, and he was converted, his entire worldview and outlook on life changed. And this also includes the way that he perceives people, as we see in verse 16. So what happened when he finally saw his sin and his need for a Savior from this sin um, is that he no longer viewed man or creation by the superficial standards that, that we struggle with and the, the standards that we often uh, judge those around us. And so rather, he saw them as Christ sees us. And here's where it's important, because when Christ examines man, he only sees us in relation to our position before him. So not the sin, but the sinner. 
right? And so the implications of this suggest that we should not be put off or appalled or even judgmental of the sins others commit or the people who commit them. So to stay true with Paul's convictions, we should love the rich and the poor, the attractive and the unattractive, the popular and the unpopular, but we also love the sinner, not the sin. And where sin is, and, and where, where great sin, uh, where there is great sin, there is always greater grace, you know? And so that is, um, that is a wonderful truth. And so this is also the example that we see with Christ. This is the example that we're now seeing with Paul. And this example should be ours to follow. And, and it is important for this reason, um, like, like this, is, this is why we proclaim the truth of, of grace and forgiveness. Uh, it is the character and love of God in satisfying the wrath of God and taking your place on the cross. So it is this reason that Paul was compelled to go and tell May it be true also of us. So people are in need of the gospel. If we don't go, who, who will tell them? And, and as Paul was writing this letter, he saw clearly that there was a need for, for people to take this message to the, ends of the, uh, to the ends of the world. And there still is. And, and, and so Paul is getting ready to call on us as the church to be the people who, who now take uh, this great message. But as with every important task, I do believe that it's in our nature to kind of grow hesitant or to even question our qualifications uh, and, and be hindered by some fear or insecurity. Uh, so thankfully, Paul very carefully and very simply outlines the requirements of those who, who get to share and who are to share the gospel. And this will be our second point, the qualifications for Christ's ambassadors. The qualifications for Christ's ambassadors. And for this, we'll look at verses 17 through 19. This section reads, uh, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So verse 17 is continuing, uh, is continuing Paul's encouragement from verse 16 uh, to, for believers to abstain from judging others, but here specifically uh, encouraging us to abstain from judging other Christians according to the flesh uh, because of what the acceptance of Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit uh, does for us, but also what it does to us. So those who are in Christ are a, are a new creation, but we are, we, are, we are not saved from the influence or the power of sin, uh, but we are saved... Uh, from the um, from uh, uh, the consequences of sin, and and so uh, and and now we have the Holy Spirit's help in fighting that, which is uh, just just so comforting. And so I right like I as a Christian, I still sin and I still make so many mistakes where I have to cry out daily for the Lord's grace, and we all do and we all should. Um, but by the power of the Holy Spirit and 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 by the work of Christ, like we have been washed and we have been sanctified. And we have now been justified. Verse, verses 18 and 19 says, uh, All this, our newness of life, is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself uh, our, uh, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting the trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So when, you, when you're asking the question of who is qualified to share the gospel, boom, it's right here. The one who is qualified to share the gospel is the Christian. So, so like my, the, the reason why I want to say this um, is because I, I, I do not want us to ever buy the lie uh, that because we are not the perfect Christian, that we are disqualified from presenting this story of, of God's redemptive plan for mankind uh, to those who most desperately need it. Why? Because like Paul says it here in verse 19, that our that our trespasses are no longer held against us, but he also says it in other sections of, of his letters. Uh, Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and so, so the Lord knew and, and, and knows that his people will stumble and fall and make mistakes, that even in spite of our many, many mistakes, the Lord still chooses to use us as the vessels that, that get to convey uh, this, this message, this, this, this story of, of redeeming works. Uh, and so... Um, but, but also, like, I do not want to say this flippantly, right? Like, um, this has been one of my greatest hindrances in, in sharing the gospel and in being obedient to make known the name of Christ. So I still struggle with this deeply, and the idea that the moment that I talk to someone about Jesus, they'll hit me with, uh, 
oh, you say you're a Christian, but you do this, right? Uh, it's terrifying, and, and it oftentimes paralyzes me. So, so although Paul has told us that the presence of sin in our lives uh, does not disqualify us from advancing the gospel, what I, observe, what I have observed from others and from myself is that, uh, and even within my own life, is that uh, before we even give others an opportunity to, to call us out, we take ourselves out of the game. Right? Like, like we disqualify ourselves before anyone else even has the opportunity to. And what I feel like happens is that we, we see our filth and we say, no, like I, I cannot represent Christ and, and be the person that I know myself to be. Or, or you know, like I, I just cannot do this and, and also be struggling with this one thing. Uh, but what's unfortunate here, though, is that by so doing, I feel like we are implying that the death of Christ actually isn't enough to make me at one with God. Uh, and, and so if you, like myself, are able to relate uh, with this, um, then I, I think I would suggest that we actually have a faulty view of the gospel and the redemptive work of Christ and what that actually does, uh, because that's ultimately the root, right? Like the idea that sin still condemns me when Christ is actually p- supposed to set me free. Um, and, and if this is true of us, then, then um, I feel that we've just completely missed the point. So, so the point is, is that I am a sinner. Like, like this is it exactly, like absolutely, I am a sinner, but I've been set free from the chains that once held me back. And the bonds that bore in me death and condemnation are no more. Um, and, and so what defines me now uh, is not my sin, but rather it is my Savior. It is Christ. And upon our judgment as Christians, it is not our mistakes that will be seen, but it, is rather, it will rather be Christ standing before us. So when, when, when God looks at us, he sees Christ. That's wonderful. So we who are in Christ are not free from the law of righteousness, but we are free for it. And, and what, what I mean by this is that we are, per, we are free to pursue um, holiness and righteousness without condemnation, uh, and, and we are free to pursue it with every bone in our body, knowing that we will come short, but also remembering that Christ has already bridged the gap for us. And so therefore, there is no interview necessary or any required skills that we have to obtain in order to be qualified for the position as an ambassador for Christ. And now we can proudly declare that we are in fact already elevated to this, to this position the moment we place our trust in him. And so, so Christ is our qualifier in, in this role as, as a Christian. Christ is the one who qualifies us, not, not anyone else. Uh, and, and so now uh, to the third point the qualities of Christ's ambassador. What, what, is, what, is, what should the, the ambassador for Christ look like? Uh, verses 20 and 21. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God, making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become righteousness of God. So this is where it all kind of culminates, and this is where Paul is able to make his point and rest his case. So we, we have this incredible news that God has reconciled us back to himself through Christ, by which our transgressions are no longer held against us. But now, because God's plan was and is to be with his created people, we now have an assignment, a great commission, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and to be representatives of Christ who do not know him. And this doesn't necessarily mean that we have to become missionaries. Um, this just simply means that we're being asked to be faithful to share the gospel in the context that we are already living in or serving in. Verse 19 said that this message has been entrusted to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. And so as we, as we look at this, and as we're considering the qualities of, of Christ's ambassadors, this leaves us with just a couple of things to consider. First, is that Christ is the reconciler, not us. Christ, like, like we have been entrusted this message but we are not the ones who, who are responsible for uh, other people's salvation. We just, we just bear his message. We get to share it. And this should really take a lot of pressure off of us, off of you and I. Um, and, and I've heard it put this way once, right? Like, like as Christians, our job is, is not in sales, uh, but we are in advertising. And, and so we're not responsible for other people's salvation, but we are responsible for telling them the, the way to get there and, the, and about uh, Christ. And, and so where does this leave us? Anytime, um, anytime we see uh, a, a therefore in a passage, uh, all the preceding text is, uh, is giving cause to the subsequent text, right? So it's kind of one of those things like, because of this, then this. 
Uh, and, and we see this here in verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Uh, and and all, um, um, all that Paul has just said uh, is, is what allows us to, to now, or what allows him to now call us this, to call us ambassadors. And so um, all that he has just done is that he has given us a reason to share the gospel because we have a promise that no one else on earth gets to have. And that promise, of course, being redemption and salvation, whereby we are spared from the wrath of God. And just as Brother Al said this morning, and, and it's really kind of nice because his whole sermon just kind of teed this up for me. Um, as Brother Al said this morning, the soul winners of Christ should weep over lost souls. Again, in verse 11, like where it says, because we know what it is to fear the Lord, we persuade others. So we, we, we persuade those who do not yet look upon the Lord of creation with awe and reverence, but are instead seeking the folly of their own ways. And, and this, this, should, this should break our hearts. Like, it will be a dark day for the Christian faith when the Lord's people fail to care for the souls of man. But what else? So, so care, for, care for the lost, but what else? Paul says in verse 14 that his love for Christ is what compels him to do this. Uh, and and I, don't, I don't want us to miss this. So, so the life of the ambassador for Christ is characterized by a heart for, for the lost, um, but also by a, a deep, deep love for our Lord and Savior. So not only this, but following along with verse 21, that in him uh, we might become the righteousness of God. And so we are to be a righteous people, morally upright and honoring the Lord in every way that we can. We are no longer living for ourselves, as it says in verse 15, um, but we are, we are living for the Lord. And it's not our, it's not our reputation that's on the line. It's, it's Christ's. And, and, and like that, yeah, so um, it, it's Christ's reputation that we have to consider when, when we are going throughout our, our, our day-to-day. Um, and, and again, to echo what Brother Al said this morning, um, and, and also following the progression of, of Paul's letter here, is that this is an urgent responsibility. Look, at, uh, look with me at verses, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Working together with them then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a, favorable t- in a favorable time, I listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of, of salvation. And so our job started the very day that we became a Christian, the very day that we were saved. And I, and I just want to pause here for a moment and, and address something. Like in, in this text, we keep seeing the word reconcile, and uh, we see it in different variations. And we know anytime we see repeated words or phrases that they must be important. Uh, there's an idea trying to be conveyed. Uh, and and so, so what is this reconciliation? What, what does it mean in this context, and why is it important? Um, and and why, also, why is it the thing that earns us the title as ambassadors for Christ? Well, like, this is what we are offering. We are offering a way for, for the lost to be found. And, and so this is our purpose and message to the world that, that you can be reconciled to God, like the sinner can be saved. And, and the reminder of the Lord's grace to us is that we can now present this hope to people who walk as we once walked because for some, their trespasses will follow them into eternity. But when Paul says that our trespasses are no longer held against us, and, and then he appoints us as ambassadors for Christ, like this is the very, tru- the, the very proof that, uh, that our sin truly just defines us or hinders us no longer. Paul was also a sinner, right? He was not a perfect man. Um, But but now we get to be representatives of the very act of grace that was done to us. And we get to tell others about the very one who saved our lives. To which I would ask, like, how can we not? You know, Uh, we, we carry the message of salvation and no one else. No one else. No other religion. Christianity. Here I also want us to consider what is the purpose in assigning us a title? Why not just say, all right, y'all, now, now go and, and tell people about Jesus? Could it be that, that titles actually mean something? Do they not assign uh, a purpose or a sense of association with another thing? Right? Like, like for, for you married people, uh, when, when, sharing the, uh, when sharing that you are uh, that the, uh, that you're married to the person that you are uh, and that this person is your husband and your wife, what you're, what you're doing is you're identifying yourself with them. And, and it means that you have committed to loving them and honoring them for the rest of your life. 
right? Or for the police officer, when they say that they are a cop, it means that they are identifying themselves with the law and are committed to, uh, to faithfully enforcing it, right? So like, so when we have a title, it, it means something. It, it, it signifies a sense of purpose and a, and a role. And so what about the role of the ambassador? What does that mean? Like what, what, what does the ambassador do, right? For, for the United States, the ambassador means that you are the president's highest ranking representative to a specific nation. Their role is to pursue the interests and policies of the United States government while being the sole representative whereby everything our country values and cherishes is judged accordingly. So this is a very weighty and very challenging task, um, yet it's all worth it because we see those who are oppressed by authoritarian regimes set free, right? And we get to promote the values that, uh, that, um, that, that we enjoy, and, and we've seen great successes in that. And so, like, we all choose to commit our lives to something, and in doing so, it shows to those who are watching that this is the thing that we are most passionate about. And, and, and like, above all else, this is my deepest love. And when examining the life of the ambassador, when, examining, when looking at the, the life of the U.S. ambassador, are they not also representatives for that which they love? So around this time last year, um, I was working in D.C. for the State Department, and it was an internship, and while there, I had the opportunity to follow uh, around the ambassador to Cambodia. Uh, we were going around Capitol Hill, and he was meeting with different members of Congress and different senators. And, and as we were meeting with senator after senator, I was able to observe the ambassador speak about the people of Cambodia with really unwavering affections. Uh, even, as, even as he was the, the U.S. representative to that country, um, and, and it was a country that was not his own, he had grown to love these people, and, and in so doing it, it it really allowed him to, to present Cambodians as a people trying to find their way in this world rather than a, a, just a wayward country that uh, is guilty of, of some really uh, severe missteps. And, and in these meetings, uh, I listened intimately to him as he, as he spoke of the gratitude that he had for being an American, where, where we are granted freedoms and privileges that are shared by no other. And I watched him as, as he just articulated that the reason that he was serving in Cambodia away from the comforts of his home, away from his family and his loved ones, was because he knew the beauties of what could be. He, he knew a better way. So he was serving in this position because of the most sacred ideas by which this country uh, was established and, and is preserving an enduring democracy that shines as a beacon of hope uh, to the rest of the world. Like, this is what he was committing himself to. And, and so here's the kicker, right? Like, like, if, if such praise could be said of a country as imperfect as we are, how much more could be said of a perfect and pure God whose glorious resplendence has been, made to, uh, has been made known to us throughout all creation and through a creation that literally bows down before him and through the incarnation of Jesus Christ by which whose death and resurrection we can now come to know this very God. And so as much as I want to, to stand here and, and use this passage to motivate us to be reconcilers of social issues and to be healers of our broken relationships, that just is not what this text is about. And, and if I did, I would, be, I would just be unfaithful to the text at hand, and I cannot do that, right? So like, so like this, this text, this, this section of, of 2 Corinthians is, is all about the gospel of Jesus Christ and God's redemptive plan to reconcile a fallen people back to himself. So, so whatever I could possibly desire to say to you all, I can, I, I can confidently and humbly say that the Bible does a lot better than I can. So, so as ambassadors for Christ, in closing, as ambassadors for Christ, we must long to see that the lost are found. And we must long and, and we, must, we must love the Lord and pray that our love for him is abounding all the more each and every single day. I hope that we can follow Paul's call for us to, to be the bearers of this message by which the Lord himself has entrusted us as stewards of. So, um, I'll close this in prayer. Father God, you are so good to us. And, and oftentimes you give us uh, gifts and graces that, that we ourselves are unworthy of. Most of all, uh, being, being eternal life. Father God, we are, we are unworthy of this, but by your grace and your mercy, you have given us a way to yourself. And you have given us a way to be reconciled um, 
to, to the one who created us. So, Father God, I pray that, that as we have, have come to know this divine secret, that we might not treat it as such, that, that we might be the stewards and, and, and bearers of, of this, this message of, of life and, and life everlasting and, and know that it is not just everlasting life in itself that we seek, but rather being in the presence of our God, the one who, who formed us. Father God, would you, would you just, again, would you soften our hearts um, for the task at hand and, and our role in it um, as your ambassadors, and, and may we honor you well in the process. God, we love you and we praise you. And, and I thank you for this opportunity. It's your name I pray. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us today. If you felt the Lord leading you to respond today, whether that was to receive Christ for the first time or to take your next step in baptism, or if you have a prayer request, we want to start that conversation with you. Visit lakeviewbaptist.org slash contact to get in touch with one of our pastors. And as always, you can stay connected with us through our social media and website.